Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right, we are continuing with the life and teachings of Paul. Like I said, we should finish this up by the end of the year. We are now starting in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy is the last letter that we'll be covering. Uh, this, this series began in January of 2014. So thinking that was going to be about a four or five month series, here it is, almost two years. Hallelujah. But we've gone through every, every letter. This is Paul's second imprisonment. Um, you know, not long before Paul was uh, um, martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Probably beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified like the Lord. Um, I've been to Rome and been in the place where Peter and uh, Paul were held uh, in the jail. And, uh, you know, it's not like our jail. They drop you down in a hole <laughs> and drop your food down to you and drop a bucket down for your, your uh, stuff. Excrement. Yeah, excrement. Yeah, you go, your waste. So, um, you know, it wasn't a pleasant thing. And, uh, but Paul, Paul was, uh, you know, writing his letters and wrapping up. And I, I just, I, every time I read uh, or think about Paul writing to Timothy, his his primary, now he's not the only one, but his primary protege to ministry. And how Paul wrote to him and gave him instruction. He's out of his heart knowing that he'll, he'll be leaving and turning this, turning this over to, to Timothy and others. But Timothy, his number one, our primary protege, uh, this letter has a lot of impact. So uh, Second Timothy, I mean, 1 Timothy chapter 5, we'll start, we'll begin reading in verse 1. And this is a, an instructional chapter, very instructional for Paul. deals with uh, how to treat elders, uh, how to treat widows in the church. Um, you know, uh, if you listen to the world, you know, love does everything. Love, to, you, know, but, you know, Paul has some very specific instructions on how to handle certain things. So let's go ahead and read. We'll begin reading here. We'll read down through um, verse 16, and then we'll come back and do some commentary on this. Rebuke not an elder. But entreat him as a father, and a younger man as a brother. And real quick, in this particular verse, the elder is not preachers, it's the older men. Don't rebuke, don't rebuke older men. Paul actually said, uh, don't rebuke an elder, but entreat him as a father. In other words, Timothy, you know, treat them as a father. Treat them with respect, you know. Um, and the younger men as brethren. Listen, the elder women as mothers. The young women as, women as sisters with all purity. They even had to throw that in back then. Okay? But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn uh, first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day, that she that, um, uh, but that she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. If any man provide not for, if any provide not for his own, especially they of his own house, he hath denied the faith and was worse than an infidel. Let a widow be taken into number. Uh, let not a widow be taken into number under threescore years old. That's uh, sixty years, having been the wife of one man. In other words, she wasn't multi, multi, married to multiple men at the same time. She was a one, actually one translation says a one wife man, okay, or one man wife. Um, She's well reported up for good works. She's brought up children. She's lodged strangers. If she's washed a stranger, uh, saint's feet, uh, feet, feet. If she has relieved the afflicted, if she's been diligently followed every good work. But the young widows refuse, for they, sh they, they have begun to wax wanton against Christ. They will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women would marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have turned aside already after Satan. If a man or a woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and not the church uh, be charged. Let it relieve them that are widows indeed. Now he goes on, and we'll start in verse 17 when we get there. So here Paul began, kind of transitions out of where he was um, in the end of chapter 4, and he moves into some specific pastoral instruction with Timothy. Okay? First of all, he says, rebuke not an elder. And as I said earlier, it, this, this term, uh, rebuke, does to me, censor severely. 
And here it does not refer to church officials. It does later when he uses the term in the context. The context here is just talking about Timothy, don't rebuke elders. You know, you don't go to the older men uh, and just rake them over the coals. Okay? You, uh, you, do, you, um, you don't censor them. Now, if correction was necessary, he was to entreat him. That's a, or exert, that's a softer term. And um, as he would his own father. The younger men were to be treated as brothers. And then he told Timothy, treat women as your mother, the older women as your mama. Okay? You know, you treat the older ladies in the church as your, like a mother. You, you treat, listen, uh, some of these young whippersnappers come in here and think that they're gods. They've got such a narcissistic attitude about ministry, they need to be slapped. You just don't, you just don't treat. I, I'm going to tell you something, you know, um, you know, Mr. C was with us for a few years. You, did you ever hear me call him harder? Man, he was 30 years my older. He was my older. I mean, as, as far as age, I wasn't a pastor, but I always called him Mr. C. Miss Geraldine, I always call and still, if I, if I see them or go, go spy and see them, I still call him Miss Geraldine. Uh, well, you're the pastor, you're the authority, but I'm to treat him as a father, and I'm to treat her as a mother. That's biblical. You young preachers learn to respect the older people, even if you have an authoritative position. That's a position. That has nothing to do with how you treat people. Okay? Your, your calling does not give you or afford you the liberty to treat elders in a disrespectful uh, manner. Okay? Even if they do something wrong, you still have to do it in a proper way. Okay? Treat your, you know, the, the uh, young men as brothers. But then it says this, very interesting. He says, the younger as sisters with all purity. <laughs> um, that's a caution. Amen? You're to have a relationship that's above reproach. Well, she's my sister in the Lord. Well, you better treat her like your sister. Remember the movie um, um, Sabrina, the remake. The original was with Humphrey Bogart. The, the remake was with Harrison Ford and uh, what's her face? Julia Orman. Okay? And, um, you know, the, uh, Linus and was David. David's out there dancing. He, you know, uh, his, his fiance is off somewhere else, and the fiance's parents are there at their big party. And Sabrina comes back from, from France, all grown up, and David's out there dancing with her out there and the, uh, you know, whatever. And uh, the mom comes up to the, uh, the Linus and says, he's out there hustling the chauffeur's daughter right here in front of his future, his nervous future uh, in-laws. And the, and the in-laws come over and say, who's that? Oh, that's Sabrina. She's, David's known her since she was two years old. She didn't look like that when she was two years old. Okay? How you treat, you know, ministers, you got to, you know, just because they're, you know, they're your sister and Lord, you st he says treat them as sisters with all purity. Keep your emotion, keep your attitude right, keep your conduct right, treat them as a God, in a godly way. She might be supposed to treat her like your sister, but she ain't your sister. Are y'all here? And there's something called, in, in Spanish they say hormones. Y'all know what hormones are? Hormones. You ministers need to watch out. He says, he says treat them as a sister with all purity. He was to avoid impropriety or intimacy in ministering to young women. You, as a minister, you've got to guard yourself. Well, I'm going to minister to that woman to help her. You better minister to that woman with somebody else around. Amen. Hello? Our, our rule is, we, you know, now I, I do and I have counseled women in my office with no one else in there, but the door is open and somebody else is in the building and can come in at any second. They'll just drift by and stick their head in and say, oh, uh, by the way, just to, just to make sure, you know, make sure the door's open so that they can listen. You know, you just don't position yourself for failure. Okay? And women that are hurting and women, you know, young, young women that are hurting can project all kinds of stuff on you and you can find yourself in a whole heap of trouble, pal. All right. Keep yourself above reproach. And that is set safeguards in place. That's all you got to do, set safeguards in place. Okay? You don't meet him at 2 o'clock in the morning when nobody else is at the church. And lock the door. I know, I know somebody, quote, a pastor, did that. 
People, people heard that something was going on, so they set up. They went and parked down the street and watched them drive up at 2 o'clock in the morning, watched the woman drive up about 30 minutes later, light flash on the front of the church. She got out and went in. They waited about 15, 20 minutes and went in and opened because they had keys to the church. Went in and started knocking, and the pastor's door was locked. Office was locked. And they, for 30 minutes, they wouldn't open the door. Finally, when they opened the door, her hair is all muffed. He said he was ministering to her. Yeah, he was, he was, they were doing some bedtime ministry. Hello? You don't, you know, you got to, you've got to protect the anointing. You've got to protect yourself and you've got to protect them from them. You got to protect them from themselves. All right. All right. That went over real good. Then verse three says this, honor widows that are widows indeed, true widows. Now Paul gives two or three classes or maybe even four classes of widows here. And, um, well, actually four and in here. One of them is widows indeed. What's a widow indeed? One that is truly a widow is desolate. There is no recourse. She has nowhere else to go. Okay? So Paul says, but if a widow have children or nephews, the word nephew is really better, uh, the Greek word really would be better translated grandchildren. Okay? Uh, let, listen, let them, that is the grandchildren, or children, learn to show piety at home and to requite their parents, okay? This, you don't get the chance. You just don't get to go dump them off on the church. It's your obligation to take care of them. Your mom and dad are married. You're, you know, you're, you're out. You got to live in or you got grandchildren, the grandchildren and, 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 and grandpa dies. You just don't go dump them off at the front door of the church and say, it's your problem, not mine. You have a responsibility. We don't teach responsibility anymore. Children and grandchildren have a responsibility to take care of those widows who are widows indeed. It's your responsibility. Well, I can't take it. You know, you know listen, no, you've got a responsibility. All right. Okay. Uh, and then why? For this is good and acceptable to God, before God. All right. So he says it's a good and acceptable thing to require or to repay or to take care of your indebtedness to them. Uh, now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate. This is really a person, they have no children, they have no relatives, they have no one to take care of them. And Paul says that there's a woman who's a widow indeed, um, and then he gets some qualifications. She trusts in God, she continues in supplications and prayers night and day. This, this one has a relationship with God. We are not, listen, Paul even does this here, you're not required to take widows outside the church. Church has an obligation to take care of the church. Okay. Then he comes up with a, a, another class, a third class, or you know, another, next class. She that liveth in pleasure. All right, um, is dead while she liveth. This is, in, you know, in other words, she turned to prostitution or other means of unjust gain to support herself during uh, because she's a widow. And, and Paul says this widow uh, is dead already. Wasn't giving them a charge to take care of them. Okay. Um, many single women restore, back in the first century they would resort to immoral living as a means of support. Uh, she that lives in pleasures is dead already. Because they had chosen to live this way, then the church was, uh, it wasn't the church's responsibility to take care of them. That means you can't minister to them, but you can't take them in the charge of the widows in the church that you support on a monthly basis, take care of all their household expenses or whatever. You know, um, they would actually, actually kind of hear, like, creates the idea there's a list of widows that are in the church that are on, on the support list. Okay? Um, and then Peter goes and says, and these things give in charge that they may be blameless. As Paul often did in a pastoral letter, he reminded Timothy of the charge, the command that he was to give. The purpose that they might, may be blameless, but they, they uh, is, um, is referring back to the widows indeed. If Timothy commanded them to stop living unwantedly, they would be blameless. But um, it must be referred to the responsibility of children to support their forebears and the responsibility of widows to fulfill the requirement. In other words, that if you're a widow indeed, you've got you to do the things he said. Um, trust God, continue in prayer. You've got to be a committed Christian. You know, not just coming to the church for a handout and keep, you know, come to the church, get your monthly check, and then go out and buy liquor and cigarettes and drugs. Churches, and we don't need, that's not what, you're, you know, that's not 
the widows you're supposed to be taken care of. Okay? All right. If anybody provide not for his own. Now, Christian families, now listen, you've got to take it in context of widows. And that's what this is primarily talking about. You've got family members who are in need. You need to take care of them. You don't need to, be, you don't need to build a wing on the hospital while grandma is starving. Well, because you get your name on the hospital. All right? If you don't provide, for, especially of those own, for, as, listen, if any man provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and, faith and is worse than an infidel. You got grandma out there starving, but you're over here living, you know, living the life. You know, whenever they want a big thing at the church, you give a big offering so everybody in the church can see that you gave a big offering and grandma's starving. You're worse than an infidel because you're not providing for your own house. Okay? All right? Now, Paul gives even more clarity on widows. Let not a widow be taken in under the, the, under, into the number under three score. You remember, under the number, into the number. It, it's kind of the idea they've got a system of people who are set up on the uh, widow's list. Okay? Under three scores. 60 years. And, uh, you know, one man, wife, we talked about that earlier. Um, listen to what goes on. Now, she's got to be 60. Then he says, well reported of for good works. She's brought up children. You know, she needs to have good child care. She needs to be hospitable. Um, if she's lodged strangers, hospitable. If she's washed the saints' feet. And this kind of may be referred to more along the lines of um, any menial task, including washing feet. I grew up Pentecostal. We, you know, we have foot washings. You know, you have, you know, have, have set aside. And we even in our, ordin in our uh, uh, manual for the Pentecostal Holiness Church, we had a, the ordinance of foot washing, how you were to conduct it and how you were to do it. All right. But, you know, I, although I don't, think, I don't think it necessarily is limited to washing feet. And you understand, uh, washing feet in those days, although it was a very menial and humbling task, it was people walked in sandals everywhere. Their feet were dirty. They come in the house to have their feet washed. Was was um, and it was it was respect and it was cleanliness. But you know, it was something they did. You know, somebody somebody washed their feet when they came in because their feet were filthy. All right, and so they. Were, but you know, here he's kind of referring to washing the feet or menial task. You know, the woman would do menial task. Um, and then um, if she diligently followed every good work. How she had a good order and how she did things. So she did, she did the things right, okay? So she's got to be 60. She's got to do these different things. She's got to qualify in these different areas. Then she can be taken into the number. But if the younger widows, but the younger widows refuse. Now here's why. For when they began to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they cast off the first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers and also in busybodies, speaking things which not doubt not. Here's the thing. He was saying that the younger widows would get themselves in trouble because they would be idle. They wouldn't, be, they wouldn't you know, if they were out working, if they went and got them a job, or they went and did things, they were a house servant or whatever, keep them out of the busybody trouble of, you know, wanting to get married and all this kind of stuff. Next thing you know, they're in the church and they're getting uh, Marvin Gaye singing their theme song. Let's get along. All right? You know? I mean, they, you know, so he's saying... That the younger ones are going, it's not they couldn't marry. It's that they would get consumed with that. And instead of being committed to Christ or committed to prayer and committed to things that they were supposed to be committed to as a widow on the list, their youth and their, uh, well, it's their sex drive would get them in trouble. And they would cause more problems in the church. It ain't the first, listen, pastors running off with the organist ain't something new. All right? It may, not, it, may, it may have been a harpist. Okay? And back in those days, you know, they ran off with the harpist. Um, it, that, these, these things are nothing new. And so Paul was saying, look, the younger ones don't need to be brought into the church as widows. You know, they're, 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 all the widows are going to be doing is praying and those kind of things. These younger ones have got too much, too much, in, too much youth in them. Okay? So... Uh, and they're going to get their cause problems to what? Paul says in verse 14, he gives his counsel on the younger widows. Get married. 
Give none occasion to the adversity to speak. Occasion here is a base of operation. Don't give a base of operation. How I many, if you know anything about Veterans Day, you ought to, base of operation. Okay? You have, a, you have a place you operate from. And he says, don't give the, the enemy or don't give a base of operation to the adversary by how you conduct, conduct yourself. And he says, he even said this, for some have already turned aside after Satan. So we don't want, we don't want to do that. All right, and so he's, and, and instead of giving them a base of operation to work inside the church and cause them disrupt, listen, do you know what happens to a church when adultery and fornication and stuff starts going rampant in the church? It destroys it. And it, it, you, sometimes you can't ever undo it. I mean, you just, it just loses it. You know, the church is gone because there's so much junk going on. Yeah, but he was anointed the Sunday after we slept together. You think. You can probably move by the emotions. Everybody's moved by emotion because they can, they can preach or they, 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 listen, you can learn how to move people with their emotions. Let me say something. I don't mean doodly squat because they ain't going to fix nothing. If it's not anointed, it don't help them. Amen? So don't give Satan the base of operation. He says, get, let them get married. Okay? Um, if any man or woman, verse 16, Has a widow. Now that's you're going back here. You got a mom, a dad, grandparent. Let them. Who? The man or woman that, that, that believes. If you're a Christian, you got parents or grandparents that are widows. You relieve them. And let not the church be charged that they may relieve them that are, here he uses this term again, widows indeed. All right? So he's got widows indeed. He's got older widows. He's got young widows. And he's got women who live in want and pleasure. All right? The widows indeed, the church will take care of. The widows that have Christian children, grandchildren, let them take care of them. Those who are living in pleasure, don't, don't mess with them. And the young ones, get them married. Find somebody to take them in. Hook them up, marry them. You two are good together. You're married, all right? Then he moves, he moves out of the widows. And, you know, they, again, this is, this, these, are, these are instructions to pastors. And he says, let the elders that rule be counted. And see, now rule well. And then what's he talking about? Now he's changed it from just elders to elders that rule. Now he's talking about church officials. Okay? Um, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Now this set of, of scripture here, it, Paul begins to talk about how that ministers should be compensated. Okay? How they're to be treated. Amen. So they'd be counted worthy of double honor. Or work. And I don't mean double, you know, you don't double up his money. It means you'd be ample or generous. Okay? Now I, now, now, I remember the old church saying, Lord, keep them humble and we'll keep them poor. That's the wrong board. Amen? Hallelujah. Now those that labor in word indeed are obviously the preachers or teachers of the word. Okay? They teach the tenets of faith. Uh, for the scripture saith, he, give, he gives a, um, he, he refers to a Deuteronomy scripture, and um, from Deuteronomy 25, 4, he said, the scripture says, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So Paul declares that the ox should not be, you, you don't muzzle the oxen. So the, the minister is worthy of, 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 of uh, compensation. Amen. That, that's a biblical principle. Now, not, and listen, you people who, who own church and, 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 and uh, congregational rule things with your little deacon board who, tell, who, who sit there and, and hold the carrot over there, shame on you. You ought to take care of him. He should be taken care of. He should be honored, worthy of double honor. He should be ample and generous with taking care of Now, listen, I don't necessarily believe that ample and generous means you've got to give him, you know, a Lamborghini this Christmas. Well, actually, I, honestly, I just don't think that's appropriate. That's, I, I personally ask, that's be above board, okay? That's a lot of money for it. Well, he's a great preacher. Yeah, but at what point do you say ample and generous and goes to excess, okay? Lamborghini could be excessive, Especially if you beat the daylights out of the congregation, get the money out of them and buy it for them. Hello? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Um, I, I just don't think people should be getting offended or pressured to bless the pastor. Okay, I don't, I don't, you know, um, quite frankly, a couple of years ago, there were some people who got offended over um, the, uh, some stuff that we, that they, you know, the church bought us a couch and a love seat. And there were some people who, who got offended. We found out there was a couple of people got offended. Over the, they felt like they were being pressured. They felt like it wasn't being handled right. So we just asked everybody just to stop doing it. Don't do it. I, I'm not going to have people in the church offended, quote, blessing me. It's just not worth it. I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to get whatever. Okay? So we just ask whoever, the people that were, you know, that, we had, we, that were in charge of pastor appreciation, just stop. Just don't do it anymore. I don't, we're not interested in people being hurt or offended or whatever over something like that. It ain't worth it to me. You know? I mean, if somebody wants to bless you, they can bless you. If they, want, if they, if they want to do it out of the heart, fine. But I don't want people pressured into doing anything. And, uh, you know, some churches, they, they go in there and they, they put the screws to the people. Well, we got to give that. We got to give Pastor, a, 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 you know, a, a Corvette for Christmas. Now, would I be upset if somebody gave me a Corvette for Christmas? No. Would I be upset if people were pressured and felt guilty and only did it because there was so much pressure on them? Yes. Okay? Things have to be done out of love because people want to. I don't mind people organizing stuff, you know, but... Um, but if it's pressure, so you can't have pressure. Well, it's one reason we don't do the, um, the stewardship campaigns. I know a lot of churches have done them. You know, they bring in the group. They tell you how much, they, they train your people and how much they can sacrificially give. And so they go, they go to everybody's house and they, put you, they, sit, they, they set an appointment. And you know when they come what they're after. They're coming to get you to commit to so much money a month for the next three years or whatever. The, then here's the deal. When the first 50000 comes in, because a company will only do a minimum $500,000 campaign, and they get 10% of whatever you raise. The first fifty grand goes to them. So you got, they train, they're training your team to go get that money. And it doesn't matter what the blowback or the fallout is after the six weeks. They got their money, and they're gone. They've gotten their six fifty grand, and they're out the door. And then you've pressured people. We don't, we, how did I get them? Oh, worthy of, uh, worthy of double honor. We should, we should honor our ministers and our pastors. They, they should be honored. They should be amply and generously taken care of. But it should be, in, in, the, in the church setting, the congregation should take care of them. In other ways, it should be because you want to, not because there's pressure. You know? Or you've been sold a bill of goods that you've got to give up and hire anointings out there, and if you'll give to it, you'll get rich overnight. Heard that too. Don't believe in that either. There's nowhere in the Bible that talks about the higher anointing, to give up to the higher anointing. That's some self-serving stuff people teach and people buy into it and then throw thousands and thousands of dollars at it and then they don't see a return in two or three years and they become disillusioned. All right. All right. So, for the scripture, you know, the labor is worthy of reward. So it's very clear here that it's talking about financially compensating the minister, okay? Verse 19, a guest and elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. This was put in here to protect ministers. Right. And you can have anybody walk in the church and say, the pastor made a pass at me. Mm -hmm. We need two or three witnesses for that one, baby. Somebody needs to have seen it. That's, what that, and that's why we set things in protection to make sure that there's no, no opportunity for that. Because anybody can say anything. They can say anything. If, they, if you're down here working, they come down here, they can, they can walk and say, the pastor tried to rape me. Were y'all in the building together for, you know, yeah, for about half an hour. Well, you see if you, you can set yourself up. Be smart. Amen? But don't, you know, don't, don't li listen. If somebody just comes to you and says, Pastor Ed tried to touch me inappropriately. Did anybody else see it? Well, no, it was, no, don't, don't receive that. Amen. You're not going to, listen, you're not going to catch me uh, touching people. I mean, I'm very cautious. 
Not because I don't think that, you, and I think that there's something, there's something going to happen. I'm just protecting myself and the ministry from an accusation that could be made because people are sent by the devil. So we just, we just do things a certain way. We love you. Hello? But we are very cautious to protect against accusations. All right. Um, but now, then the sin rebuke before all. If you get elders in the church, ministers in the church, you know, people in church, and they are in sin, rebuke them before everybody. Why? That the others may learn to fear. You're going to get caught. You're going to get rebuked. And let me say this. All rebuke is for the purpose of bringing restoration, protection and restoration. Now, Paul goes on to Timothy says this. I charge you before God, the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. And he's kind of, he's kind of shifting gears now to ordination. Lay hands on no man suddenly. Hmm. I have one lay hands on people hard, fast, and continuously. <laughs> That's why this scripture's in here, because he knew I was coming to pastor. Hallelujah. <clears throat> no, this is, this is in reference to don't be quick to ordain people. Don't do be too hasty. Okay? Neither be a partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Keep yourself untarnished. Now, why? You go ordaining people too quick, and they go out, and they're in sin, and you find, everybody finds out that they got all these kind of things in their life. Guess who gets tainted also? The ordainer. You know? Oh, we, we, we recognize, I, I've seen it happen with young ministers. You know, they can preach, or they can hoop, or they can spit cotton to the fifth row. They can get people stirred up, and you come in, and you ordain them, and set them apart, and set them in position, and next thing you know, they run around women in the church. They weren't ready. I said, they weren't ready. You, you give, you, you know, you, you let them have some room, but you don't have to ordain them and set them in and put them in that position because they, they know, and you set them up. And if ministers, if you, if you've got, if your church ordains, licenses and ordains, and you're ordaining people too quickly, you are, you, you're setting them up for failure. And Paul says, don't, don't be hasty. Don't be hasty. Don't take these young, especially these young whippersnappers who think they got it all together. They, they, they've gone out, they've mimicked all the right uh, communication skills. They've got the look. They know how to design their book and tape table. They know how to do everything just right. They know how to market. Let me say something here. We live in the age of marketing, and we know people can market stuff and sell you anything if it's marketed right. It may not be worth a flip but it's marketed right. Hello? I mean, you've seen television commercials about food places, and boy, it looks some kind of good on the TV. You get into the restaurant and get the food, you think, where in the world did they get this trough, hog trough food from? We had a restaurant here in Greensboro a number of years ago. Everybody was so excited it was coming. Um, I won't use the name of the company, but they were down on High Point Road, at Interstate 40, that building's been three things since then. It used to be a um, Bennigan's, then it became this particular restaurant, and it was a it was a kind of a Shoney's. It wasn't Shoney's, but a Shoney's competitor type restaurant. I didn't say I was calling you any names. I didn't say who it was. I'm not con neither confirming nor denying. Went one time. It was hog trough food. They ordered the, you know, because you can order grades of food. I don't know if you know this. If you're in the food industry, they have A grade, B grade, C grade, like vegetables and stuff. You can, and they're all C grade. And you go in there and eat it, and you're like, and they're charging how much for this? And that? Come on, guys. I ain't coming back here. But the television looked great. I mean, it all looked good on television. Looked like grandmama's home cooking. It didn't taste like grandmama's home cooking, but it looked like it. Hello. Yeah. Now see, my wife learned how to cook. That woman can cook. 
Yes, sir. She's about got me trained. How many enjoyed the spaghetti today? Janie did go taste it and season it. Anyway, but it says here, um, don't be too quick. They may have a gift. They may have a calling. They may be, you know, in the future they're going to be used of God. But don't ordain them and set them apart too quickly. Let them grow. Let them grow in the safety of your covering. And then you can mentor them and say, you can't open yourself up and get yourself in trouble. Now, I saw you the other day at the church, and you were, you were a little too close to that single woman over there. Now, let me tell you something. I'm your pastor, but I'm also your, spirit, your, your, your ministry mentor. I don't want to see that again. You conduct yourself. See, this protects them. It'll save them trouble in the future. Now, you're not doing it because you don't, you're doing it because you love them and you want to see their gift fulfilled. But, you know, listen, I don't want to see, I don't want to see that all huggy, snuggly stuff again. You know, it's too, it was too comfortable. Hello. Which is why you're not ordained yet, son. Because you, you got to get this, these kind of things straight, maturity. Then we can do that. We can talk about that. So he said, don't, don't do these things too quick. Okay? Um. Then he says, drink no longer wine. Now, obviously, Timothy was a total abstainer. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for medicinal purposes. I can't even imagine what Brown would do with that. He would, he would mutilate that. For Medea purposes. He would say Medea purposes or something. Listen, use a little wine for that stomach's sake and often for me. The eastern water was polluted. Bad. Uh, Paul was, I mean, obviously Timothy was a pure drinking only water, and Paul writes, said, look, use a little wine. What? It was a purifier. Mix it with the water, it would, it would kill bacteria and stuff, the alcohol would kill that. Drink a little. Hey, did you notice the optative word here? L-I-T-T-L-E. He did not say drink the white wine with the fish and drink the red wine with the steak or the lamb chops. He said drink a little. Why? Because you've got infirmities. Okay. For thy stomach's sake, thine often infirmities. Um, that's all I said. It, 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 you don't need to say anything else. Timothy was an abstainer. Timothy wouldn't drink wine. Paul said, look, you need, you need to take a little. And you're not going to get drunk on it. Just put, put some in your water, purify the water, you know, help your stomach out. All right? Everybody say medicinal. All right? Be like going to get, go into the doctor and getting uh, some, some drug for your stomach, you got, you got, you know, uh, Imodium or Pepto-Bismol. Getting something that helps your stomach at that time, they didn't, they, the wine was the purifier, so they could mix it in there and, and purify the water some. All right? He says, some men's, are, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to the judgment. Some men they follow after. In other words, open sins just lead you right to the judgment. Hidden sins follow you in there. You're not going to get away with it. If, every, if it's open, everybody knows about it. If it's hidden, God knows about it. Okay. Likewise, also, though, good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that otherwise cannot be hid. In other words, God, God knows when you're doing things in secret. You know, let's see good works openly. All right? So, this ends chapter 5. We're not going to go any further because, you know, next week is chapter 6. And uh, I know a lot of this was, was dealing with um, church things, but, you know, Past, members need to know that the pastors have charges. They're charged by God to do certain things, certain ways, for certain reasons. And a lot of people always want to come along with that. You know, well, but love would do this. No, love does exactly what Paul said for it to do. Amen? People can get off on these tangents, and I, I tell you, they act crazy about them. They act like the other things in the Bible weren't written. Well, if you love people, you would take those younger widows in. Paul said, don't take them in. And I think Paul understood love. He's the one that wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He's the one that wrote Romans, what, 5-5? Five, five, or is it 5-5 five, five or 8-5? The love of God was shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost? 5-5. Five, five. Okay. He's the one that wrote, you know, love, you know, love is patient, kind, all that. Okay. He's, so he wrote a lot about love. And then he turned around and said, don't bring in the young widows. Why? They're going to cause trouble in the church. 
don't get on a narrative that, that, that excludes all other Bible narratives. Now, we, we, you can do it with righteousness teaching. You can do it with faith teaching. You can do it with grace teaching. You can do it with love teaching. You can do it with any teaching, make that the only narrative and exclude all others. And you'll get out of balance. And you'll get into error. So we want to, we want to include, be, be inclusive of all scripture. Even if it messes up our narrative. Then you're just going to fix your narrative. To line up with the Bible. Amen. Just like the Bible. Just like the Bible. Just like the Bible says. I got the Holy Ghost down in my heart. Just like the Bible says. I love coming camp meeting song. Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving.